Commissioners, we're going to call the meeting to order. I have 703, and we have a quorum, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So first off is Citizens Communication. Uh, we have a couple folks here that aren't on the commission. I don't know if either of them were wanting to speak, though. Um, I'm, my name is Katie. I live in Bloomerville. Um, I'm going to Texas Tech currently to get my nurse practitioner's license or my, my nurse practitioner's degree. Um, and so we're just supposed to follow somebody from that's on the commission board. And I thought that Parks and Rec would be a great opportunity to see how it works with children and the population in Pflugerville for health quality. So, cool. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for letting thanks me be here. here. Mm -hmm. All right. Next, you have the minutes in front of you. 3A is to discuss and consider actions to approve those minutes from the last meeting. I've got a couple of things. Is this okay? So, um, on number two, citizens' communication, Dale Wilkie, his name is actually Woodkey, W O O D K E Y. And when we get the minutes, are we supposed to write you back and say, hey, we got some changes, or is this the appropriate time? To this make is the appropriate time. If you had some, we could have. I didn't yeah, even, no big deal. Yeah, no big I deal. Apologize. So, Dale. Wood key. Like the word wood and the word key. That's correct, all together. And I do know him personally. Um, and then on page two, 4B, um, and some of these are really picky, but you know me, Shane, so. Sure. Uh, okay, so in the second paragraph, it starts to shameize the second, second sentence. He covered the parks and recreation departments. Departments needs to have a um, apostrophe, okay. a possessive, and then the very last sentence of that same paragraph, the main roles of the parks and recreation needs to have an S put in there. And I got two more yeah. on page three, second paragraph, first sentence. Uh, Ms. Sellers explained the location that should be where, where the mirror will be installed. And um, then that third paragraph, second sentence beginning with Erin. Erin mentioned that she and the artist could work together, not her and the artist. Just making sure that we pass English, the English no. class. <laughs> um, some people on the board remember what it was like when only Junior and I ran this thing. And uh, <laughs> those that don't are getting a refresher of what that uh, sounds like. So, yeah, no big deal. Okay. We can make those changes. Um, with those suggestions, does anybody else have anything? I just need a motion. I'll second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Next up is the director's report. So you can see our program and events for the upcoming month. Uh, yoga, chair yoga, total body, high, low and Agents of Discovery, this month it's in Geneva's Park. Um, all of those are recovering, or recur recovering, that's what I'm doing. It's a recurring <laughs> event. And then programs and events, we've got the Daddy Daughter Dance coming up, um, our jewelry making class, our Smash Brothers tournament. Unplug and Explore is gonna be at the Bullock Museum. Uh, we're doing Dungeons and Dragons uh, every other, looks like every Monday except for spring break week. Uh, senior uh, greeting card making class, the magical masterpieces, senior movie night, and the DYI hair accessories at our spring break fun camp. So a lot of activities coming up in the next month. Seniors themselves have a couple events carved out that they're traveling to. Looks like the Texas Stars hockey game, the Austin Antique Mall, downtown Bastrop, and the Mexic Art Museum. Special events, our spring planning for special events, you can see, you know, it's really tough to see, actually. I apologize for that. Um, you can see we have Slice of Pflugerville in this pink. That is April 27th, right there. That's our Slice of Pflugerville event. Deutschen Fest in this 
periwinkle? Am I getting close? Um, is uh, the 18th, 19th, and 20th. Then Coffee and Fuel is the first Saturday of every month. Music in the Park, we're, we're trying to do some different dates so we're not out there baking. Uh, music in the Park, it used to be a summer event, so uh, we're starting some in May and we're trying to extend them into the fall. Festival of Lights is the first weekend in December, first Saturday in December. Main Street Music is something we're doing. It was a little bit like the small stage series last year. The Eclipse, if you haven't heard of the Eclipse, it is coming and we've been playing in it and uh, and it should be a, a, a big hairy deal. And April 8th uh, is when it's happening around noon, but we're, we're trying to see if we're gonna be doing some planning. The city is preparing for what could be an influx in people that are coming to maybe see the Eclipse that day from not just even local or regional, but people from outside the area, people that are flying in. Is the um, city providing those cool little sunglassy things? Maybe so. Who knows? Still plenty of time. I know that hotel, in our previous internal meeting, hotel um, bookings are up, I think, 70% over those dates wow. previous years. Oh, really? Wow. So, wow. And I think Austin is preparing. Austin's also hosting the music festival, CMT or something, some sort of awards musical. So. People might be coming in for that and then also catch the eclipse and catch the musical we're, awards. We're on the edge of it, right? We're not, we are. We're not, we're not dead center of it. Um, and we understand that a lot of people that are traveling out of town may be the peers that want to be right on the line, but there could be plenty of people that want to see it from a really nice right. spot like the lake and don't want to put up with as much traffic as there might be in Fredericksburg or Kerrville, and so we could be an option. Where's the egg hunt this year? Uh, egg hunt? It's going to be at uh, 1849 Park. Just gonna go yeah. there first time. Yeah, I think we're gonna go there the first time this time around. Uh, Juneteenth looks like uh, June. What's that? Second, ninth, sixteenth, so twenty third. And then our pride, pride looks like it is got a couple dates that they're considering in June. The second Saturday or the third Saturday. Uh, Red, white, booms our Fourth of July uh, fireworks that we partner with uh, Typhoon Texas and then Apalooza. Um, you might have saw the sign when you came in as well, but the rec center is going to temporarily close down for a week. A lot of us are going to TRAPS, which is our state conference. The ones that are staying back are helping us get ready for spring and summer. We're going to redo some floors and some hallways, do some maintenance of the gyms, and they're going to be working on a, a redesign and install at the uh, front desk area. <laughs> Nor that, that's the uh, storage room. Um, we have some seasonal hiring coming up, some opportunities. So if you know folks that are interested in an opportunity to work seasonally for us, looks like we'll be hiring close to 100 uh, lifeguards and pool managers and learn to swim teachers and a couple different positions in the aquatic side. And then around 20 camp counselors for summer day camp as well. Um, we're going to be having multiple job fairs. We've already attended a couple at some community colleges and some of the high schools. We'll continue to recruit. Um, but anyone that's interested, please send them our way. We'd be more than happy to put them in with Jonathan's team. Whitney and Timmy are the folks that will be over, over a lot of the hiring, the aquatic side and the program side. Park projects. You go tell them. You'll maybe tell them whoever that is. <laughs> um, is that part of their renovation? You're going to be yeah, thickening so. the walls? I think it's the <laughs> gymnastics group, and uh, it seems like they're doing some – Heavy lifting. Um, <laughs> park projects. So shade, you'll see Pfluger Heights and Black Locust Park were the last two to get shaded. Um, that puts us at 97%. Uh, we have 30 playgrounds and 29 of them are now shaded. When we started this plan a couple years ago, we had 60% shaded. Uh, we've been super aggressive and the council and the leadership has been very supportive of us trying to get 100% of our playgrounds shaded. And we're one away, Central Park in Falcon Point, the last one. Uh, we also just, so we normally give you information on our shade, or on our playgrounds, but the shades themselves, 80% right now are under 10 years old. And the last six that'll happen with the playground replacements will put us at 100% of our shade under 10 years old. So not only are we shading um, the playgrounds and making sure that the, the participants have a break and a, a healthy break between the sun and them and they can dwell a little longer in those playgrounds, we're also protecting and trying to continue to 
um, invest in that property. So you've got shade that is 10 years or less um, protecting playground equipment that will be 10 years or less and um, standard for playground system is 15 years when you start to consider without shade. Sometimes shade will add about 25%. So this shade in the playgrounds that we're putting could go um, could go 17, 17 or 18 years. So we're, we're excited about the uh, replacement program and the shade. Pole barn, uh, we put a pole barn out at 1849 to also protect that investment. All the equipment that we have out there is going under a pole barn. There's only a couple things left. So the next time you're out at 1849, go to the football side, you'll see the barn. Uh, there's some punch up items. We're gonna be putting a corral out there, a fence, so we can put our equipment that stays outside like trailers and things out there as well. Um, and there's some um, surface drainage that they're working on with some river rocks, but uh, we're super excited to get that uh, completed and in our hands so we can start storing a lot of our maintenance and equipment out there. Upcoming park projects, we're super excited. We have a lot of stuff coming down the pike, uh, a lot of things we've been working on. Um, the Heritage Park Playground is, you can see one um, image of what we're considering. So, you know, essentially you have the green-red barn out there. So this would be a playground that mimics the green-red barn and throwing distance away from it. So we think the kids will really appreciate that. Uh, we're keeping the shade on the, on the left side of this photo. That shade's already there. We're keeping that, and you can't really see, but we're adding a little green John Deere tractor there, then this barn, and then we're putting a shade up that's going to help block uh, the sun as it uh, as it rises in the morning as well for anyone that's on the play side. Um, we've been doing shade simulation, which I didn't know was a thing before I was a parking rec director, but uh, um, we're, we're trying really hard to get that playground replaced. Um, the Heritage Park itself has a loop trail that's DG. We're also working to have uh, that trail upgraded to uh, concrete for ADA reasons. It's part of the ADA master plan, some of the improvements. Gillen Creek's got a playground that's been approved and uh, a pavilion that through a study um, said that we needed to do some things to it, needed to upgrade it, and uh, we're working really hard to get both of those done uh, before summer. Our summer day camp spends a lot of time at Gillen Creek Park and Pavilion, so we're trying really hard to get those done by May. The playground mid-March, end of March, is when they're looking to have it dropped and then take a couple weeks to get it vertical. Uh, but it was part of a grant that Kelsey applied for when she was here for a game time grant, had matching components, and we were able to use the funding saved on that matching grant to go towards uh, a poor and play surface. So uh, for the folks that don't know, we have a couple different options when we put playgrounds in. We have turf, which we haven't done, but some people do. Uh, we have it a little more to treat. We have a pour and play surface. Hello. And uh, which is that which is that ADA uh, accessible material that you see sometimes it has a little give to it. And then we have wood fiber or wood mulch, which you see a lot in a lot of the playgrounds. And some places will actually put pea gravel. We don't do that. Some people put tire um, um, bits in there as well. We don't do that either. But some, uh, and when most of our playgrounds have wood fiber mulch in them but the ones that are close to the creek system anytime a creek will rise uh, it'll run off and then we got to replace it so because Gillen Creek's so close in the floodplain and we had a little funding saved over not only were we able to get shade uh, but we were doing that um, poor and play surface that ADA safety surface so Shane is the pavilion are we talking about the one that we use in Deutschen Fest yeah the pavilion? big one so what are the improve you said improvements to that yeah, so it had a study done, and it was in really good shape. There were a couple things that needed some welding um, reinforcements, and then it just needed a refresh. And so they're, they're going to do some welding improvements out of some of the uh, connection points, and they're going to be putting some masonry um, columns up, and then a spray and wash and a, and a couple coats of paint. I'm concerned about the electricity, the outlets, because those blue, remember they blew on a bunch of bands that were over there? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure the guys can look at the yeah. electricity. It might just not be rated for that, because I don't think we have a lot of issues with it when rentals happen, but we'll have to figure out something for Deutsche yeah. Fest. It may just be an infrastructure issue. 
Uh, Mallard Pond is another one that we're working on right now. Um, that's part of and will be funded by the bond program, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It's the only part of the Murchison Mallard bond that is on the Mallard side. It's this little playground replacement. Playground's, I think, 18 years old. We're working on getting it replaced and making sure there's shade over it. It's another one we're looking at a pour and play surface because it's so close to the creek system as well. And then all the other bond improvements will happen on the Murchison side of that creek. Cambridge Heights uh, Playground is approved. Cambridge Heights Challenge Course is going to Council um, middle of March. And uh, it's one of those play ninja type courses that folks can get out and matriculate their way all the way through. And they can time themselves or they can just do it for fun. And uh, the Cambridge Heights Park has this really great loop trail and it's got that vast green space in the middle that we're going to put this um, play feature on. It'll be shaded as well. And then Stonehill, uh, we've been working on uh, putting a basketball court in, but this basketball court has something cool. It's called a gopher system. When you think of the, a, a, goal, uh, a gopher, um, you know, something that comes out of the ground. So this comes out of the ground. It's, uh, it's like, uh, like your handle with your luggage, just kind of spring loads up. And it has a small net on each side. So it can be used for 5x5 five five soccer. It can be used for inline hockey. It can be used for, you know, I guess any number of other activities that would have a net. Where, where is that going to be? Stonehill Park. Well, I don't know where Stonehill Park is. Stonehill Park right now is Stonehill Development. Um, I mean, I know where Stonehill Shopping sure. Center is. So is it So Stonehill, you know the Stonehill Shopping Area. Mm -hmm. Then behind that target are all those hotels. Behind yeah. those hotels are... The uh, um, apartment complexes that have been around for five or ten years, yeah, those yeah. apartment complexes. The goat, the new goat. Yep, it's a, it's about a quarter mile further west. towards, um, west. yeah, west. Okay. okay. Yep, it's got a dog cool. park there right now. Oh, cool. It's got a small and large dog park. It's got some really nice trails. It's got a splash pad. It's got a little pavilion and a playground. Check that out. This would be adding a, uh, a basketball court that we're going to try to get. Um, we're trying not to just paint it like a regular basketball court. We're trying to have um, a fun design. We keep thinking of the kids sitting at the second or third row of the apartment complex and are looking down over that space. We want a real inviting little spot that oh, that's a good idea. kids want to come to. So uh, we're putting some geometric shapes or something on it. And then you can go out there and play basketball, but you can also go out there and if someone's on one half the court and you want to practice soccer or something on the other half, you just raise that goal up and you can play a little half court soccer game as well. So. Um, we'll be the first in the state of Texas to have them. They have about 10 or 12 out in, in the Parks and Rec system, but we're the first in the state of Texas to have one. Nice. And we're looking forward to implementing it. All right, new folks coming on. Uh, Zachary Brown uh, was a groundskeeper previously before he came here. Favorite food's chicken wings <laughs> and loves to paint. Stephen Campos came to us from Extreme Cabling. Favorite food is beef fajitas and loves spending time with his family. Alyssa is our new rec specialist. Um, she was the assistant to the director in LaGrange and before that she was in New Braunfels. She also worked at Earth Native Wilderness Nature School in Bastrop. Is that, are you familiar with that at all? No. Okay. It's a huge place. And Texas State grad. Uh, Jeff Ashay. Uh, you can see uh, he worked at Harker Heights the last 11 years as a supervisor, superintendent. In the last five and a half years, he was their director. He's coming on as our assistant director. He'll be starting March 3rd. We're super excited to have him. He's on our Texas Recreation and Park Society, what we call TRAPS, um, around here. But he's on the TRAPS Board of Directors and is the legislative chair for the state. Uh, does a lot of presentations um, to the legislation at the Capitol and is our point of contact in our industry for any legislative nice. things. He's good. Nice. We're, we're excited to have him. He's a Texas A&M grad. Lisa missed out on that. She got to, she could have whooped all over the place there and is a huge sports fan. And then we got a couple goings. Um, Juan Ramirez and Brandon, uh, two great guys. You can see them. We caught them, captured them together. But uh, Juan worked here, was it 12 years, retired, and then came back? I don't know if his, his, if his wife said, you got to go. You got to go back and work a little bit more. But Juan's worked almost more than 15 years with this total in the city. And he has finally said, enough is enough. And his last day is next week. And we'll be sad to see him go. 
And then Brandon worked with us. He, he moved his way up from a crew member to a crew leader. Uh, over the last couple of years, Brandon's run our weekend crew. So if you were ever on the trails at the lake, if you were ever renting a pavilion on a Saturday, you saw Brandon and his crew go in there, change trash, make sure restrooms were looking good. Uh, Brandon, since he moved in that crew leader role, has had a couple kids, and his wife doesn't like to be single parent on the weekends anymore. So he's going to go work in pest control and have a bit of more of an eight to five and, and get to see those kids grow up on the weekends. So those pesky wives. Those I pesky. Tell you I'm, not, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. And that is the report. Is there any questions? Awesome. Next, we have our uh, pollinator and tree care subcommittee updates. Um, tree care first, just give a little background, and then Jim is the only one here to speak on both. Um, so uh, it was formed on November uh, 2022. It's one of our oldest. Um, the committee last time we voted was last year, it was Jennifer Carroll and Chelsea. And the subcommittee works to support tree care advocacy, ISD plannings, Arbor Day support. I cover that pretty well. You do great. Do you have anything <laughs> else to say? Uh, no. I mean, I'm hoping that we, well, if I get reappointed to the subcommittee, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, look at some other projects we could possibly do with it, more tree planting ventures. So, but. Yeah, and this was something, and we'll mention it, we're, we're doing some elections tonight, unless y'all don't think, because we don't have a full amount, y'all want to push it, but um, it was something that we originally created because we didn't have a day yet, mm -hmm. didn't have a forester, and uh, um, it was just Junior and I kicking around things. We were trying to figure out what we were doing, and we, there was a an, an issue, a, a desire to do more on the tree side. And we said, let's help, let's get a subcommittee together and see what the need is and what we do. The ISD plantings came out of that group, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, so it's it's been a great group. Next is the pollinator subcommittee. It was formed last year. Um, it was formed in April. The committee was elected at the same time the other one was, or re-elected, uh, Jennifer, Michael, and Chelsea. Michael's no longer with us as far as, I'm sorry, that sounds like he's not here. <laughs> That's not what I meant. Michael's no longer a commissioner. And uh, so it's just Jennifer and Chelsea. There would be an open position. Um, subcommittee update, uh, citizen reps as well for this, for the Monarch Sanctuary Project. Um, are on this group as well as B City USA. Um, Jonathan gave me some notes. They have a meeting a quarter. Next meeting is uh, next week, and they are researching and continually working towards striving our B City USA designation. Um, they have been working on a presentation for a mowing ordinance. They're working on Keep Texas Beautiful Award and the project plan that are coming out of that award that we were granted last year in the grant project. And they're supporting the Xeriscape project, which came out of a conversation with this group about a year ago with, uh, what are we doing with those flower beds out there? <laughs> so we're going to do some Xeriscaping out. Anything else to add to that? Oh, you did great. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah, yeah okay. that's good. Yeah. Any questions on either of those? To yeah, I'd like to know more about BCD. I don't know, and I, I apologize. I'm new, and I don't know who else is new. If y'all have already had these discussions, I don't catch yeah. me up on BCD. I'm so B City is a designation that you can apply for. There's a series of um, things that you have to do to to be um, considered. accredited or considered, okay. um, and some of those are not. Um, some of those make a lot of sense in a parks and rec format, but it gets really tough in a citywide format. Like if there's a pesticide that Public Works uses to kill weeds. Yeah. They can't use that if we're BC USA. So it's not just yeah. a parks and rec initiative, it's a citywide initiative. And so this board is looking into that. And Austin, it took Austin, what they say, four or five years, right? Something like that, yeah. It took Austin four or five years to get into compliance where they could apply and receive the accreditation. And we had a lady that led that from the staff side come over and speak to us about a year ago. And then there was a citizen on that committee that's actually a Fleetville resident. And nice. she served on the Austin committee. So she's one of the reps. Um, when y'all have these meetings and uh, it's just continuing to inch for towards that compliance okay. things cool. so okay. making sure that all the things we're doing and chemicals not just public works for example but our pool chemicals and everything else are in compliance to a B city USA a pollinator city friendly um, application so cool. there's definitely some layers to it it's some work but mm -hmm. I think it's something that we all feel like is something worth working towards yeah 
So Anything instead else? of be- being a rock and between a rock and a weird place, we could be B City. Yeah, we could be, <laughs> could be Just between far a, better a than B and a butterfly place. <laughs> there you go. Um, any other questions on the committees? Okay. Uh, next up, uh, five year CIP. So one of the uh, joys of this committee is y'all get to give a recommendation of planning and zoning for our five-year CIP. Um, I realize not always some of the terms we talk about, you're, you're not always super familiar with it, so I want to make sure everyone's comfortable with what we're talking about here. Um, I think one thing that people get confused is bond and CIP. What's the difference? What is CIP? Uh, CIP is a capital improvement <laughs> program. And, so, and, a, and to be quite honest, a bond is a capital improvement as well. A bond is a capital improvement that we took that project to the citizens and they funded it um, through um, the bond process. And so then the city can call on those bonds and in the three or four or five or six years and they can get that, um, they can get that funding and then they can go implement on that project. CIP in our framework is usually unfunded. So it's projects that we know need to be done. Sometimes it's projects that are backed up by a a study or a feasibility assessment, but we don't have any funding for. So we are working on a five-year CIP to tell city leadership and council, ultimately, here's what we need the next five years, and then the next year is what's funded. So last year, we came and talked about CIP with this group. This was the ultimate recommendation for last year's CIP. It's what we're working on right now. These were funded by council, ultimately, in the last uh, budget um, process. Historic Water Tower, we're working on right now, and I'll explain that more because I've got all the programs. Um, I have a little update on each of them, just so a summary so everyone knows what we're talking about. But the Historic Water Tank um, and Old Town Park project, uh, the relocation of the Manual Roads Pedestrian Bridge, that one y'all passed coming in potentially, and then improvements to Wells Point Phase 2. We also have some funding that we're going to see potentially every year as we continue to request that through a couple different plans. One is our Aspire 2040 plan that talked about making sure that we, we always had safe passageways for schools and retail and everything else. And that's kind of the public right-of-way sidewalk component. Two of those came off our ADA master plan. We did a citywide ADA master plan a couple years ago and it gave us marching orders on what to do in different parks. and. So you'll see some of this funding every year that we're going to try to allocate to parks. And then annual connectivity is part of our Trail Capital of Texas uh, campaign as well, that we're always con- trying to continue to connect our trails to other trail uh, attachments throughout the city. So that just, that's what last year looked like. What I'm going to explain next are the current bonds. These are all funded. Now, they're not all completed. Some are in different processes, but these are all funded. Just kind of making you aware of what is and isn't because your role as a liaison to the community when someone asks where are we at with some of those things you'll have a little bit more of the lexicon of what is a bond what is a cip and where we're at downtown east uh the rec center portion of that um 2018 2019 we did a needs assessment that said listen this city needs a larger facility the quality of life component our standard for a city is one square foot per population So this rec center is our only square foot service population. And right now it's 23,000 square feet. And our population is over 23,700 people. So um, we have 75,000 and we're growing every day. And we need a facility that can serve all of those residents. And so that needs assessment said we could do it. That needs assessment told us the range that we could offer, you know, where we could put it, how it would compete with private sector. Gave us a lot of great feedback and marching orders. We took that to... Um, the bond steering committee ultimately got it on the bond. It became Prop C of the 2020 bond, and it was approved, $47.3 million. During that time, between the time that the needs assessment happened and we went to the prop steering committee and the bond was pushed back, we, we were talking about doing the bond in spring and then we pushed it back in the fall. The cost of doing business, if you all remember, raised. Um, COVID had a, had a huge impact on inflation and what it cost to get goods and services for these construction projects. So what used to be a $47 million rec center really felt like it wasn't gonna be what the citizens were expecting um, in a lot of ways. And so we had that to deal with and city worked really hard dealing with that. We, we continued to push forward and purchased the Fluger track, which that's part of what you see here. 
29 acres across from HUD that ultimately sees City Hall, the rec center, a really great plaza for us, some retail, and then phasing options for future development to happen. Uh, we, we, not we, City Council uh, selected a steering committee, a citizen steering committee that would help create the program for the rec center. That was done in 2022. Uh, and we worked as a city with PCDC for them to support ultimately a $78.5 million rec center that would go back to what the city was expecting when they voted for that bond in 2020. And PCDC is going to help support the Delta, that difference uh, through 4B sales tax. Um, 2023, we already on the rec center side, so this, this block over here, it'll look a little bit different than that, but the rec center side already hired an architect firm too. Um, FGMA and BRS to work with us on the program draft and the citizen steering committee and help us with some of the engagement to the public we did with the master plan to ultimately find what the will of the public was for this rec center. But that still had to fold into the master developer who's developing that whole property. Griffin Swinton and Catellus were the firm that council selected in January 2023 to be the master developer for that 29 acres and our architect folded into their agreement and has been working with them in lockstep making sure the rec center that we're all expecting and excited for is the rec center they deliver as well as the city hall and the parking and the retail and the plaza and all that the master developer griffin swinton and catellus are the group that's doing that we haven't finished but we're pretty close to a conceptual design and when we see more you and the rest of the public will get to see what that rec center is going to look like we're super excited about what it is and super excited about what the extra support from PCDC has made a difference in that facility. Um, some folks went on the rec center tours that we did and we went to New Braunfels, DOS Rec. That was a facility that at the time was a $38 million facility. That was kind of our goal at the time. We wanted a facility similar, which is why we kind of right sized it with inflation to 47 when we went to the bond. Um, it's a it's a 78 or 80,000 square foot facility, a really nice facility. Um, and Kelsey, our former AD, opened that facility. Uh, this facility is, is still in the range of about 120,000 square feet, so it's going to be much bigger um, than DOS Rec. So we'll make sure to brag to them every time that we'll invite them to our opening. But uh, it'll be a bigger facility, and I think that makes a lot of sense because we're continuing to grow. We're not going to stay at 75,000, right? This, the population build out of this, this thing's got to serve, not just us now, but it's got to serve us in 15 years. And so we're excited about the support and, uh, you know, bringing you on the next couple months when we can, uh, what that conceptual design looks like. Next up is land acquisition. Uh, something I've just always done in the departments I've tried to lead is make sure there was land acquisition in the bond program. Sometimes you'll put a bond up for a rec center and then it costs you $10, $10 million to purchase the land and now it's not a $47 million rec center anymore, it's a $37 million rec center because you had to go buy land first. And so we wanted to make sure we had some funding. So if we needed to buy the rec center, we'd have space. If we didn't, if we needed to buy the destination play space, we'd have space. And if we didn't need to buy either of those, which is ideal, we still have the opportunity for potentially up to 20 or plus acres in current development dollars that we could go use and find or spend when a, the right opportunity opens up for this community. So this part of Prop B, the rest of the things other than the rec center, everything else will be on Prop B. And it was about 5.6 million. We've used some of it on land acquisition, but there's still plenty there. 1849 phase two, part of Prop B. 15.2 million is the expansion of sports fields and additional infrastructure at 1849 Park. Um, they're close to construction plans now. You can see two baseball fields, a softball field, and then an event lawn space that kind of doubles as a practice area as well. So, you know, if you're warming up or stretching, you've got an opportunity to do that on that event lawn space. Um, those, those three teams that are loading on or those six teams that are loading onto that space will have an opportunity for stretching, warm up, and then they can, they can go to their assigned fields and the offload of that first round of games can go there and all the parents can sit around and talk and, Talk about how bad the rest were, and then they can hop in their car. <laughs> uh, next up is Wilbarger Creek. 
Phase two, it says Prop B. It's a $3.3 million project approved by council, uh, I want to say the fall of this year, um, this, this last year. Uh, it's part of the neighborhood ex uh, park expansion. Uh, we, had, we had four or five parks that uh, were undeveloped parks that were developing, and this was part of it. Uh, Wilbarger Creek North was part of the bond in the 2016 program that got developed, and this is Wilbarger Creek, what we're calling phase two, but essentially south. It's got trails, a trailhead, picnic tables, parking lot, restrooms, growth, we'll see a dog park, a natural play area, so an, an, an outdoor classroom space, and construction is just getting started. So this one's, we're super excited about. Kellane Park's next. It was part of Prop B. It's a $1.9 million budgeted item. It, now, I will say, going back, anything that says neighborhood expansion, they were all lumped in together. So it was like $7.6 for all the neighborhood projects. But I'm showing you how they're broken up. Uh, Kelly Lane will have a playground, pickleball, pollinator garden, and some trails. Um, we're still working with Transportation, who is also through, the master, through their bond program working on the expansion of Kelly Lane. We're just trying to make sure we time all that right at the same time. So that one isn't to construction documents yet. Hey Shane. Yes, ma'am. On that one, I, I can't see the map real well. What are the, am I looking at Kelly Lane to the north? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, and Kelly Lane's right boundary. here. And this then, is Kelly Lane. So what are the east and west boundaries? Uh, this is a pro, re, uh, re, residential property. Uh, this is the uh, circle street, something street. camp. No, I'm just looking at the street. This is right where you go across the creek just past the golf course. Going, so, going, going east. Board. Pass the golf course. Falcon Point Boulevard. That's what I need. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. I'm Falcon looking for Point a Boulevard. street name. Yeah. Right gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Falcon Point okay. Boulevard. But the east one is, you're saying it's Falcon Point Boulevard? Yeah, it's Falcon okay. Point. Okay. And then Piccadilly. Uh, Piccadilly is a park that, um, through some of our planning, we've realized has a lot of easements and drainage and a lot of impact to what, um, <laughs> what we can do in a floodplain. You don't want to put a restroom or uh, a vertical facility in something that someone has an easement on because they have every right to tear it down to get to that easement. And you can't put some of those vertical structures in um, floodways and some in floodplain what, areas. What do you mean by vertical structures? Like a restroom okay, or a parking lot. Yeah, yeah, any type of like that. We could do things like playgrounds potentially, but you're still even mitigating um, surfacing right. that you're putting in there. Um, so what we're trying to do is really just put like a respite, a, a place that you can go, escape. It's got some pollinator gardens. We want to do a lot of really cool landscaping here. Uh, maybe flex our landscaping muscle a little bit, not something we do in other places. And have a trailhead that will eventually connect to the backside of that HOA and potentially extend our trail system. But uh, maybe not immediately. It would, it would potentially follow this creek. Um, you know, we could we could envision our property in tier and the HOA owns the rest of this property. We could envision maybe a, a, a trail potentially connecting to our trailhead and then following uh, through the creek system. Merchant Mallard, like I talked about earlier, the Mallard Pond part is just that playground replacement. The Murchison side, about a million dollars, um, part of the neighborhood expansion program as well. Uh, we have a playground. Uh, we have pollinator spaces. In fact, we have a really big, like, really well done pollinator space. The, the folks that are designing this, um, one of them has a degree in whatever a pollinator person would have a degree. And so, uh, pollinating. Yeah, something like that. So they're super excited about it. It's one of those degrees that you say it and it's like, you're making that up. But uh, <laughs> um, so this is going to be a really cool pollinator area. And it has some open space and some trails as well. And Lake Flugerville Phase 2, uh, about $11 million for expansion on the north side. Uh, the mouse there will show right about here is where the current beach ends. Something like this is what you're looking at. So you would see almost a complete doubling of the beach potentially. And then all this hardscape isn't there right now. I mean, we have some sidewalk. But we'd be extending some hardscapes that's going to include some shade, Potential splash pad and other play components, um, you know, restrooms, shade, walkways, and we're, we're really excited about what that potentially looks like. 
ultimately, and I'll refer to it more in a little bit, but there is a preliminary design report that I could share with y'all. It was done in 2019 <clears throat> by half. Uh, but it is the, and it's online as well, but it is what the master plan of the lake is now. It's, it's the improvement. The original master plan was done in 2012, let's say. This is an improvement showing what's needed in the preliminary design report. And it's got the boardwalks, which you can see here. Um, it's got a trailhead, which you can't see off to the side, and the Beely expansion, which would be a nature center. And I'll get to all that in a minute. But this phase, <clears throat> what we're calling 2A, would be the beach expansion and all the hardscapes and restrooms and shade and really fun components that potentially go with that space. Lake Flugwheel phase one was some, was some infrastructure and utilities going to those spots as well as parking lot expansion. And then the destination play, 2.7 million. Um, we're wanting to do a, a destination playground that'll really attract people from all over and uh, kind of submit uh, to not only our residents, but also to the people around us that we really do care about the play value of a community and that you know it, we're a safe place for people to come and enjoy themselves all abilities wise. So that location is to be determined. Part of the reason we still have some land acquisition dollars, although we are looking at some parks internally that we think would be a, a, a good spot for this as well. Okay, so that's the bond. Those are the bond projects. Some we're working on, some we're not working on yet, but we will be working on. I uh, like the destination play in phase two of the lake. We haven't started on those, but uh, as soon as we get a new assistant director in, that's gonna be one of the first things we're starting to work on. And uh, some we've completed, like the trail gaps and some of the wayfinding signage that uh, we did as well. So these are CIP. These are the projects that uh, at one scenario or another were unfunded. They could potentially, as you will see, parts of these have been funded through the current year. So we're working on them. You'll see the first three that I showed you in 2024. And then some other projects that we know need to be funded at some point. So the historic water uh, tank and Old Town Park. Uh, total projects, about 1.7 million. Um, we're going to take Old Town Park, and we're going to take that. Then we're going to take that water tank, and we're going to try to make that a really cool spot in the Old Town part of town, where people can come and gather, maybe learn about some historical things that happened in that area, maybe get to engage uh, water features and other things in a way that they've never engaged it before, and, and have a really fun experience there. <clears throat> and Old Town Park will be improved. The playground will be improved in that process, and. We're not doing an off-the-shelf playground for this park. We're looking for a really cool park that would have um, some sort of agricultural component maybe to it. You know, something that bleeds to the old town feel and the water tower improvements. So more to come, but we're super excited about what that's going to look like. Next is the Emanuel. Right now it's a pedestrian bridge. I believe at one time it was a, <clears throat> it might have been a bridge that wasn't a pedestrian bridge, right? Yeah. And it's been serving uh, the Fluterville uh, community before Fluterville was a town. I think it's 80 plus years on this bridge. And so it will be removed when Emanuel Road is widened. And there's a strong desire to keep it, store it, refurbish it, and then put it somewhere. You know. Yeah. Don't know where yet. Uh, there's been talk at downtown east, but there could be other locations in a park setting or in another development somewhere that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it'll be a $2.8 million project through and through. We are hoping to maybe get some grant funds for that because there's going to be some historic components to that. Uh, but for now, I have 100000 allocated, as you all saw on that previous slide, but I can't do anything until the road is worked on because I'm not going to pull the pedestrian <laughs> bridge part off before the road's done. So it's a timeline thing right now for us. Wells Point Park, phase two, phase one, we improved half the fields last summer allowed kids to work on the other half while we improve those. Now we're coming around and doing the other half of those fields <clears throat> and working on some lights and new fencing. And uh, it's our fourth most used park. It has over 70,000 annual visits in that park alone every single year. And this improvement, uh, we got it budgeted for right over, right under 1.1 million. Boardwalk I was talking about in the PDR, the preliminary design report that was done in 2019, approved by council. Uh, the boardwalk, uh, is, it connects and it's got a couple of spots that are covered overlooks. 
and uh, it would also replace some of the piers that we've had issues with uh, that portion of the project would be 1.2 million Lake Fluville, what we're calling phase 2B, because I showed you phase 2A on the bond. This is the complete redesign of the Beely House, turning that space out there, uh, which used to have the Beely House on it. Now it's got the Beely Garage that Junior Skies use and some um, greenhouses that we use for our butterfly projects and some of our tree farm stuff. Um, but ultimately, you know, we would envision that space to have a nature center, some community gardens, some demonstration gardens. Um, uh, some classrooms, an event line space, um, uh, observation area, an intro, a, a beginner's fishing area that we could stock. A lot of cool things could happen at this spot. Not a cheap uh, improvement for sure, uh, but one that I really think would expand what we offer to the community. Uh, 10.8 million on that project. Pflugerville Park, uh, Pflugerville Park Trailhead. Uh, this is off Silent Harbor Loop. <clears throat> It'd be a construction of the Western Trailhead, and uh, it would have a small parking lot and restroom lighting and landscaping. Part of that PDR as well, and it's uh, just under $2 million. And then 1849 Park Phase 3. <clears throat> so if you can follow with me on my mouse, this is Phase 1, this L right here, minus some of the parking lot we didn't get. Um, this is phase two, ball fields and some parking. And then phase three is potentially this space up here. This, the T of the Fluger uh, 1849 park area of the old Fluger family track. Uh, this is Carmel. This is where all those homes are now. And uh, this is somewhere around here is Weiss High School, the elementary school and the middle school and the fire department off Weiss Lane. Um, phase three includes a festival area. See it here. Uh, playground, amphitheater, uh, covered picnic seating, uh, group pavilion. It's got some nature trail areas. You can be able to walk out in some of this, uh, uh, some of this natural areas, some of this floodplain area. It's got pickleball courts over here. That can also do tennis courts. It's got a five-acre dog park. Lisa once again is missing out. So that would be the biggest dog park we've offered. Um, a small parking area, and that price tag is fourteen point one million. Now I. That project and this project here, oh, sorry, this one here, those will never go into a normal CIP, probably not from the park side, because in a CIP, as we submitted in an annual submission, the city would have to fund those immediately, right, instead of bonding. Those are type of projects that we either parcel out, uh, especially 1849 Park, like we may just do this portion, right? You know, the dog park and the sand volleyball court and the pickleball, and that may only cost two and a half or three um, but uh, it would it would it would probably be a rare occurrence that you would just see this go on a future CIP as itself it's probably phased now if there's another call for bonds if the city says hey we're interested in doing another bond program those are the type of projects that elevate from a CIP program to a bond program they go from unfunded three years from now to fund it immediately, right? That's how you build your bond program in a lot of ways. Unfunded projects that are approved by plans or projects or master plans or feasibility studies or whatever. The, the parks portion of those two private developments are that that private triangle on our left there, uh -huh. the one next to it, right? Yeah, this is, uh, um, yeah. Merchant Track, and then next to it's Camera 96. Y'all saw those. Right. Um, and we're going to have, so this is Melbourne, Melbourne Lane that comes through, but these connection points, these trails, will actually connect <clears throat> through these developments. So the people along Cameron that are going to live in those residential areas will be able to access 1849 Park in the trail system. An update to the master plan. Master plan we approved last year. This one won't be up for a couple years, but uh, update every five years is needed. It helps us stay in compliance with Texas Parks and Wildlife and keeps us eligible for grants, which we'll be needing for some of the other projects that we're going to be uh, putting up. Another is our downtown trail corridor study. So I uh, probably should have done a better picture. This is just a cool photo from a park in North Carolina. But if you imagine uh, the old rec center, 
in the trail that we're at right now. You follow it through Bowles Park under um, 685, and you follow it up along where now downtown East new development will be, and you follow it all the way around to Finnick Lane. Um, that area is what we have been referring to as the downtown trails. And so um, when we were working with the architect for the rec center, one of the things that he was talking about for this facility, once the new one's built, they'd made a couple different options. It could be a, a youth space, it could be this adventure center, it could be an event center, it could also be like a nature center. And they were highlighting the trails that we have that very few other agencies have for their community. You know, this trail that's going to lead all the way through, it's going to go right by downtown, it's going to go under, it's going to go by the outdoor fitness court, it's going to go by the Gillen Creek Pool, it's going to go by the new pavilion and the new playground we've done, and then Pfluger Park, and then on into Finning. There's a lot of really cool spaces there, a lot of place-making opportunities, a lot of quality of life components in there. And what would be great is to have a plan that kind of articulated how we're working all that in together. And then we could start to go after <clears throat> grants to fund a really cool pocket off this trail that might have uh, an amphitheater or a performance space, or it might have an outdoor fitness court space, or it might have a couple different um, sensory components, you know. So we want to know what we can do to highlight that trail corridor and then use that study because we know that studies that have have – plans on a shelf are the most likely to be funded for grant programs. So I can't just go text for a while and say, listen guys, I got a really cool idea. Just go with me. They want to see something that's been supported by council saying, yeah, this is our five-year plan for this trail corridor. And then they're like, okay, cool. Let's talk about phase one. We've got some grant dollars. So that's what we're looking for with a study like this. Feasibility study. So we have 33 acres of ball fields right now. We get about 50, 45 to 50 acres of requests every year in field allocation. We can't serve everyone. And that's only going to grow. Uh, we know that this community is going to grow. And we're just trying to evaluate the opportunities correctly and try to right size this situation for this growing community. I don't want to be part of a community. And not only am I here as the director, I'm here as a resident. I want to be part of a community that has a really great park system, has a really great trail system, has a really youthful family opportunities in all these different ways, but doesn't have any place for their, those kids to play competitive sports, doesn't have any way for them to do, um, you know, any type of outlet in that way. And so we are trying to assess what the needs of the community are and what the next five to 10 years look like. And so we can go to council and say, here's the recommendation. We need another 1849 park or whatever it is. And, and not only that, let's find out if we need more cricket fields or do we need something that's unique that we're not offering at all, that we're, we're trying to piece it all together. We're saying, oh, yeah, if you use part of this field and part of this field, you can do your cricket. Yeah. You know. And so we're trying to make sure that we're serving the community correctly. And the best way to do that is the feasibility assessment. And then last is what I was talking about a little earlier. It's just our annual trail outlay. And every year you're going to see public right-of-way sidewalk requests. You're going to see unpaved and paved ADA trail requests. And you're going to see annual trail connectivity. And those just come from the last couple of plans and the good inertia we've created for our trails, for our connection. So obviously the 2040 comp plan, the master plan, the ADA master plan, and then our master plan and the truck capital of Texas efforts that came out of it. So the CIP process is next time we bring the CIP back, we're going to break it up into years. So I'm going to take that 14 million dollar bite of the apple and I'm going to say we can only do 3 million this year or whatever and but we also still have to plan for some other improvement because you can't only do just one project right so our next time when we come back we're going to recommend how we break up the next five years with those um, with those improvement possibilities and then y'all will vote if y'all support that or if y'all will have the opportunity to say no I want to see this here and this here and then that recommendation goes to planning and zoning and then from there, it goes to finance and budget. And at some point, it's seen by a citizen committee there. And then it goes to council and city leadership for a series of workshops. And ultimately, um, will be approved, hopefully, at, at the end of August or so of this year. Any questions? Awesome. Okay.
Well, I've been doing all the heavy lifting today, haven't I? Okay. Uh, subcommittee. So this is appointments and subcommittee renewals. Um, we, and I, this is discuss and consider, and uh, our chair and our vice chair are not here. <laughs> so we can table this, we can discuss it, and we can just agree to not vote till next time. Um, but there's two positions on this board. The chairperson presides over the meetings, so y'all don't have to hear me talk, and encourages, make sure we, we adhere to the agenda and encourages decisions. You know, make sure we get to a vote so we can make recommendations of planning and zoning. They also serve as a liaison to us and to y'all. So if y'all have questions or concerns, you usually talk to the chair. The chair will say, hey, let's think you're a big jerk. And I'll be like, I get it. Just <laughs> that. Um, and then the vice person, vice chairperson serves as the chairperson if the chair is asked. And if both of them are not here, it's me. <laughs> so, so are we supposed to vote on their reappointment tonight? No, this is a new. Oh, okay. They get, they get locked in cleaned up every time so if they were here today they would have led it up until this point got it but they're not here so i was leading it but tonight we can either vote without them which i have every right to do because we have a quorum or y'all could say i don't mind waiting another month and we can wait a month to vote i move that we wait a month okay a second third Five A is tabled. I can't remember what Trista said last time, but is it okay for me to take a potty break? Does yeah, we're still stop? at quorum. We're okay. still at quorum. Oh, let's hold on. We got a motion in a second. Oh yeah. Only she could table it, right? So I do have to have a vote to that. Okay, I'm sorry. So we have a. Let me. <clears throat> if she was here, she could table without y'all's consent. But if she's not here, we have to do an actual vote. So who was the motion? Me. You can. Pick your pick your second. <laughs> I think, I think uh, Ray was a close. We're tied. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're gonna have a vote. All in favor of tabling both of these votes till next time. Aye. 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 Any opposed? No staying. Okay, five zero. Thank you. Next is subcommittees to renew. So I explained it a little last time, but we have three subcommittees. Parks Foundation, there's no need for it to renew. It will, the, the folks that are in it will see it through. It'll die off. We have Tree Care Advisory. Um, and the question there is, this was something we did without Dave, as I talked about earlier. We can still do it with Dave, and you can support Dave. Dave may require more meetings. Um, <laughs> Dave, Dave may want to meet with y'all every week. No, I'm just kidding. But he may want to meet, I don't know how much y'all have been meeting previously, but he may want to meet monthly or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, okay. And then we have the pollinator subcommittee, which we have not achieved BCDUSA, so I assume you ought to be interested in that, seeing that pollinator subcommittee continue. We can also do new subcommittees, but we can't do it right now because I have to post that. I have to tell the community we're going to have a subcommittee on ice cream, and then we can have a subcommittee on ice cream, but I didn't do that. So the only two we're really talking about today is tree care advisory and pollinator would y'all want to redo them and if so we can do elections for them why why does the parks foundation not need renewal because i think it's like at 90 something percent yeah we basically it's at 90 percent. it's like we've, we've formed it they have formed it so the we're at the point where we just need to meet with staff now to like actually get it everything approved by council and you could have parks foundation do another update to this committee and you could have them explain what they're doing to this point but I think, and they think, if at 90% that close to the finish line, you completely changed who was on it, right. okay. you might have, uh, we might have, might lose some momentum. Yep. So, so that's one thing I can do. I can have a more robust, I know we kind of gave them one last time, but maybe the actual plans and the board and all that stuff. Yeah, we won't, might want to wait until Jeff gets started and we can contact oh, him if that's yeah. okay. Yep. Uh, just because, yeah, just because I think we'll have definitely have more of an update after that. I agree. So with maybe that. like April ish. Okay. Yeah. And we can also table these as well, knowing that a couple people aren't here. We can talk about it. Uh, this is discuss and consider. We can make votes tonight. Um, I believe Jennifer said she was at least interested in one, if not both, of those again. Yeah, I was gonna. I actually was gonna see what people's opinion were on the the tree care advisory and and you, Dave. If you if you guys do think that we should continue with that subcommittee, if you think that would be beneficial to you, um, 
I got a question before Dave speaks, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, who was on the committee last time, or how many were on the committee, or was anybody on the committee? Now that which one? Board? Well, the one we're talking to, Tree Care Advisory. Yeah. So we had three. We only have two of those people now that are members. Ah. Okay. Carol's no longer um, with us. No, she's no longer a commissioner. Um, she's no longer participating. That's right. I have to say it the way I said the other one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it was formed. It's our longest subcommittee, and uh, they were renewed. Um, so they haven't had a full year's run. We could wait if you wanted, or we can do it now. We're trying to sync them up more where they're more in line with our chair and vice chair votes. And then if you want to give them a little update, but basically what we said earlier, the ISD plantings, the Arbor Day support, and then I think y'all, out of this committee, I think y'all have been pushing for uh, the, the mulch. Compost? Oh, we were we were asked uh, the did a letter for com composting, composting things like that. Yeah. Oh, I didn't yeah. realize that was from the sub. I forgot that was from the subcommittee. Yeah. But yeah, no, I was just I was curious, Dave. Do you like? Do you think it would be beneficial right. to continue this or? Yeah, I see. I actually see a lot of value in it. Personally. Okay. I, I, would uh, be, I, would. I think moving forward, I'd actually like to see more involvement. Yeah, uh, I think that'd be great. Yeah. He said weekly. I was thinking actually three times a week. <laughs> no, I mean, I could quit my job. That's <laughs> yeah. If you could do this just completely on your own. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, that's your right. idea. No, but you know, maybe, maybe okay. quarterly. Yeah. Uh, we so, can keep it in line with the uh, with the urban forest updates and things like that. Maybe. So I assume yeah. the subcommittees are subject to all the open meeting stuff. So you have two or three, so you never have a quorum. So as long as you are talking. Uh, without communicating through an email, it's not subject to any type of open records. If you communicate through an email um, okay. or you communicate through a device, you need to do what Trista talked about and right. making do sure do either we're email. tagged in so we can make sure it's okay. saved somewhere. But you have every right as a quorum to meet or as a subcommittee without a quorum, just the two of you or the three of you, to meet at uh, Dairy Queen and talk about. Okay, so it's a little less, so the yeah. meetings are a little less formal. Yeah. Okay. That's why they're kept under a quorum. They're a subcommittee. So that means the quorum of the entire committee. Yeah, you don't. So less than the quorum. Of yeah. The so you don't. You wouldn't have four. Right. So it's three okay. or less. Yeah. So I would be interested in joining that committee. Mm -hmm. I think we should probably wait until we have everybody. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but maybe like if any of us can't make the next meeting to email your interest if you're interested in a subcommittee, just so we can't get the voting. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. But yeah. Are you interested in doing it again? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then I think Chelsea might be. Probably. Am I excused? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and you did good. You're on New Forester, right? I've, I've yes, never met you, so. You, Dave? Do we have to move to. And I'll do a lot. Doing, 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 doing less talking than I do. Yeah, he's coming up. He's <laughs> gonna, I know. He's going to come up. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, we'll have to. I would assume that if y'all wanted to. Uh, um, table this. You also want to table pollinator? I think so, yeah, because I, I know Lisa was interested in that last time and we ran okay. out of positions. Who was I'm Michael very was interested one? in that. Michael was the other one, yeah. I'm, I'm very interested in that. Yeah. So I would I would need a motion again in a second if we were going to table this vote. I said a motion. This vote for both? Yeah, we're going to do both under one motion. I move, I move that we, we postpone, we table. Yep. All subcommittee. Yep, subcommittee, sir. I'll second. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none. Okay. All right, Dave, come on back. <laughs> How was it that time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny why you left. <laughs> you want me to, you want me to, you do, you want me to? Uh, you, I, we, I, just, I'll do it. Just wink at me? <laughs> Yeah, you just do it right. All right. I do apologize for not having uh, 20 billion slides. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> but they keep me busy in, so I try to keep brief. We already spent a lot of time talking about where we're at in the uh, citywide tree inventory. So we've completely inventoried all publicly owned trees at this point. Uh, we're a little over 5,000. We by the intern? We, I helped a little. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I did about maybe 2%. Uh, <laughs> she did a uh, bulk of it. Um, but um, where was I at? Sorry. So a little over 5,000 um, is where we're at. The majority of what we have is going to be oaks, uh, about 33%. Uh, and of that, probably 14% of uh, live oaks of our entire canopy. Uh, I put that on there kind of as an example of what this data is used for uh, and what we're going to be using it for in the, in the future. Um, so now we know, okay, we've got a third of our canopy or oak trees. Maybe we do planting projects. We need to diversify a little bit. You know, maybe, maybe kind of slow it down on the oak plantings. But... Uh, so can you can you explain what that is, what the census is, and how it's done for our new people that don't really know what that's about? Yeah, so this part of the actual public tree inventory, uh, we brought an intern on. Uh, we're losing our GIS people stole it from us. Uh, so actually, she's on vacation next week, and then she comes back to the city in a whole different building. They won't mess her. But uh, we sent her out into the wild with the tree ID book and said, go count trees, basically. Uh, she went out, uh, we have uh, ArcGIS on our phones and tablets, uh, went out in every single park, every single right of way that is maintained by the city. Um, but these are just the maintained areas, basically the areas that get mowed. And every time there was a tree, she'd go up to it, we'd collect data on how big it is, the health of it, uh, any kind of risk that might be associated with it, species, uh, proximity to roadways, buildings, all that kind of information. Uh, so some of that's going to be used for maintenance needs down the road. Uh, the big push for it now was to kind of see what we had as a city. And, and I'm going to plug it a little bit. I, I think I plugged it last time, I'll plug it again. We're going to be developing a, uh, a urban forest master plan in the very near future. So there'll be another subcommittee to vote on. Uh, the, uh, but this is the very first step of that. We can't develop a plan if we don't know what we have. So, so that's where we're at right now on that. All right. So, doing the tree inventory and the and the canopy assessment had three different parts. So the first one was a direct inventory of what publicly maintained trees we have. Uh, second one is going to be the I tree canopy report, which I'll print it out for y'all. Uh, so this is going to give us a really good idea of how many, how much tree cover we actually have in the city. Uh, the way that it works, and the, the first sheet is our current city limits. The second sheet is the RETJ. Uh, so this program takes a map. Uh, you can do as many dots as you want. It, all the doctrine recommends a thousand points. So a thousand points within the city limits and a thousand points in the ETJ. And then, and then uh, this is why we hired an intern. And then <laughs> she had to go in. So for these 2000 points, uh, tell this program what was on that randomly generated point. Um, I did this for my last city. It's extremely mind numbing. And uh, I'm glad. We found someone who enjoys doing this. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, uh, so that gives us a really good picture of what we currently have. I think. So this is where we're sitting at right now. So within the city limits, we have a little over 19% tree cover. Uh, it's not great. It's not bad. I think it's uh, it's a really good spark to, uh, way to start off. Uh, we're trying to build the tree canopy. ETJ, little under 10%. A lot of that is because all that land was cleared out, you know, 200 years ago for agricultural purposes. Um, I imagine that a lot of that 10% is going to be along creeks and things like that where, you, where it just wasn't usable. Uh, so I was able to find some data from 2013. So we got about a 10 year difference. And even without doing anything, it's already gotten better. So I wouldn't say we haven't done anything. Uh, Planning department's done a lot of, uh, has a very aggressive landscape standard for developers. Uh, I know developers complain about it a lot. 
I mean, tough. <laughs> Not to say tough. We do want development, but development also wants to be here. So that's just kind of their part of the cost of doing business here. Uh, yeah, and then I mean, in ten years, man, I should have included that on the slide. Just looking, we also within the city have a, a program called Near Maps, so we can look back at satellite imagery. I think starting in two thousand sixteen. I mean. I can circle a canopy and we can do every year and see how much bigger it gets. So a lot of this stuff, if we did absolutely nothing, it would still probably increase. Uh, but it's not going to happen <coughs> in our lifetimes. If, if we try to set it, if we set an ambitious goal, we need to kind of back it up with ambitious action. So, but we haven't set any goals yet. That's going to be part of what the, uh, master force master plans for. So, and so this is a pretty standard thing in uh, urban forestry. It's a 30% tree coverage, or canopy coverage. Uh, and there's different schools of thought on that, but that seems to be the pretty standard. Um, Seattle, you know, in the Evergreen State, doesn't even have 30%. So, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's too, uh, too much of an aggressive thing, but it's just an interesting thing that without, without thinking about it, without planning for it, it's really hard to achieve. Uh, we have a lot of undeveloped land, so we are, I think we're in a really good opportunity to start thinking about that now. Uh, how are our neighbors doing? So Austin's got 41%. I uh, think they're better than everybody. Mm -hmm. the, uh, but what Austin's, Austin's been thinking about this for a very long time. So they've, been, they've had a lot of time to, to kind of get to where they are. Um, and if you look east of 35, it's actually 22% is what they have. There's a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, like ours is going to be agriculture. Theirs is because that's kind of their industrial areas. So, you know, ours is bare ground. Theirs is, uh, you know, a concrete jungle. So we might be in a better position east of 35 than they are to, to expand the canopy. But they've set a very ambitious goal. They're trying to get 50% citywide. So uh, Round Rock, uh, kind of right where we are. We, we got to combine about 14. 14.65, I think it was, and then Taylor's also about 14. Huddo, uh, we're blowing them out of the water. So, but I think round, all three of us, I think we're all kind of having the same issue. There's just, uh, the land was all cleared out for agriculture, and now that, you know, we're kind of developing in the suburbs rapidly, uh, we got a lot of opportunity there, so. So what the next phase is also using iTree, but a different program with iTree. It's called iTree Eco. Uh, so this one, it's really similar to this. This one will only generate 250, and we did this one combined with the ETJ and the city limits. Uh, but this one, you have to go out, you set a diameter of, six, of 72, it's a quarter of an acre and every one of those 250 things, and you inventory every single thing within, I'm sorry, tenth of an acre, everything within that tenth of an acre. So trees, shrubs, uh, what's on the ground there? Is it, is it leaf stuff? Is it bare ground? Is it grass? And you, and it's, we've already done two points. Those are mostly test plots to kind of see what we needed to do with that tech, with that, uh, with that. And, uh, it's very time consuming. I think, you know, you're probably looking at maybe two and five, five every time you go out. So, uh, one good thing about Kirsten being kidnapped is, uh, her supervisor promised that we could use her whenever. So we're going to take advantage of that. <laughs> uh, and then I'll try to find a day, a week to go out and try to get as much done as I can too. So hopefully between the two of us, we can get it knocked out relatively quickly. Uh, but, what that's going to do, if you look at the eye tree canopy on the back of them, it kind of gives you these calculations. And they're very broad statements. You know, uh, carbon sequestered in the trees annually. It's kind of a broad stroke. They kind of base it on what's on what those dots are, but that percent canopy is. When we go out and inventory these 250 locations, we're going to know what's in that location. So what type of tree there, how big that tree is, is there 10 small trees, is there you know, two giant trees? So that's gonna give us a much clearer picture of all these little numbers here on the back of this. So, And then something interesting, uh, 
if you wanted to look at this, the I couldn't tell you the complicated math that goes into it, but this program does give dollar amounts to the actual benefits of the trees. Uh, and if you combine kind of these numbers, the dollar amounts at the end, that's what our tree canopy is worth right now. Uh, 14 million? Is that one on the ETJ? Is that, the is that here? Yeah, 14 million. That's going to be the ETJ, and then within the city limits, almost 19 million. So, And then it also gives you the annual. So how much it's, it's going every year, it's, it's raising. So it's it's a pretty good program. Uh, it's pretty standard. It's a pretty standard program used by municipalities all around the world to get this kind of data. So. Wow. So when I ask for money for tree planting, just remember, you know, we're, we're managing. Nineteen million dollars. <laughs> all right, and then just a quick update on the. Uh, and for the new members, who's all the new member? I'm sorry. Okay. So we have a, we got $150,000 from the U.S. Forest Service uh, for an urban, urban forest, urban and community forestry grant. Oh, and one of only, what, two or three in the state? Uh, yep. Was it, was it, it might have been four. Okay. I can't remember if Houston got nice. some. Less than five. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and not our big neighbor to the south. That's right. I actually feel bad every time I talk to him. Yeah, I try not to talk about the grant. <laughs> but, so um, they had to meet certain criteria. Uh, this was a big push by the Biden-Harris administration to get into uh, neighborhoods with lower equity. Um, in Pflugerville, that really only fell into one section. It's uh, three neighborhoods, but inside one one section found on the uh, the equity map. Um, and I really wish I were here last time because I got we got a lot a much deeper dive on to what this grant is and what we're doing with there. But uh, basically, within that area, and it's a majority of its Windermere neighborhood south of the south of the creek. Uh, the only about fifty one percent of the I'm sorry fifty one percent of the neighborhood either has no trees in their front yard or has uh, diseased, dying, or declining trees or heavily damaged from the various storms that we've had uh, the last couple of years. So um, basically it, it, it was, it checked every box that they were looking for for this grant. We submitted it. Uh, I asked for about, I think it was 165, they gave us 150. So we did have to rewrite the narrative and rework the budget. Uh, but we were able to get it in. We're done on our end administratively. Um, the US Forest Service is using the Arbor Day Foundation is a pass-through to, because they, they had, they gave money to organizations in every single U.S. territory, all 50 states. So there's a lot going around. Uh, it's a, I mean, it was a, I think over a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar investment, multi-trillion dollar investment. I can't remember. Uh, they did, they sure did brag about it a lot <laughs> at the time. <laughs> but, uh, so we're going to have a meeting with them next week, and then hopefully they, at the end of that meeting they give us the green light. Um, we won't have everything logistically done uh, probably before the end of this planting season, but we're going to really hit it heavy head in the fall. So we're going to try and get the, at least 335 trees in those three neighborhoods. So. But we can't force tree, we can't force people to plant trees. So, right. We'll but, you, but you, but the grant includes pl uh, planting the trees and and this watering that you can hook up that's automatic and all that stuff you talked yeah. about before. It's really cool. Yeah. So it's, uh, it makes it e makes it easy for those people to. Yeah, because I've done a million different uh, tree planting things in neighborhoods, and then you always come back in a month and half the trees are dead. Uh, so with the opportunity. With that much money, we yeah, temporary irrigation systems are going to be installed for every single tree. Uh, nice. and then of course, uh, you know, I am everyone's urban forester with a P. So if they have any issues, they um, they're going to have my contact information. We can go out there and get it all things. All the trees are going to be under warranty uh, from the nursery. So worst case scenario, we can, we'll just replace them. Yeah. 
So. So how much impact or influence, that may not be the right word, do, does the city have with developers coming in with residential developers, you know, just slicing down all the trees and then building apartment complexes and houses? Is there a relationship yeah, with the developers? The rules and codes have that they have to follow about legacy amount. trees and the, <clears throat> the width of trees. And uh, Dave's, Dave's a part of it. Dave goes out there and assesses those sites and and says, no, you can't cut this down, and you have to keep this one, you have to build around it. And uh, we, have, we have a pretty, tr pretty healthy tree fund, which developers have put into, that you have seen us be able to grow our canopy from. Not only enforcing that the developers plant on site, but us being able to come back and do hundreds of plantings, you know, as well. Is on school sites and throughout our, our park system. And so um, the development, has been nothing but helpful, even though yeah. they don't always want to plant all the trees they're required to plant, and would love to cut down every tree they would need so they can build what they need to build. There, yeah. we've it, we've been able to have um, a healthy tree fund and a growth in our canopy from the the rules that planting has. Okay, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. Another yeah. reason to move to Florida. There you go. Has, um, <laughs> has hiring <laughs> Dave. Uh, has having you on board changed the way that it works or improved it? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, everything. Parks and Rec has a lot of different things. You have people that are aquatic experts, and no, know, know, experts, and and the stuff that you don't do, you lean in heavily to staff, or you learn in a self defense type of yeah. way. And we were pretty self defensive in our forestry side before Dave got here. I mean, Junior and I could go out looking at a tree and tell if it was dead or not. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> other than that, we were in some trouble. So definitely having Dave here. Has been yeah, I think of, I don't want to say anything negative, but <laughs> I, do, I, I do have one kind of one foot in the parks and then one foot. I was going to say, this is a cross city. Yeah. 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 And uh, a lot of times it feels like I got both feet depending on development. <laughs> There's uh, so much development going on. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And it, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that's been kind of a big impact. There's, because our code is very, I, I really like our code uh, as far as, uh, uh, UDC, or the Unified Development Code, but there was a lot of language in there. It's a very thick book, you know, and there's one chapter on tree preservation, you know, one chapter on tree preservation, or most tree stuff. A little bit, there's a, you know, a couple sections within chapters, you know, and, you know, and our, our planners aren't arborists. So there was a lot of stuff that was misinterpreted or wasn't interpreted properly, and uh, they didn't have anybody available to go out and check the tree inventories that these developers are putting in, which is where I'm finding a lot of, oh, it's... So know. that's that's the type of thing I was asking about. Sure, so yeah, absolutely. has improved that process, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have one development, I'm not gonna name names, but yeah, for some reason, two heritage elm trees didn't make it on the on the tree inventory. <laughs> Whoops, Yeah. You know, right where they were gonna do a lot of grading. You know, so <laughs> was a, so it's like, oh, you know, maybe we should, you're gonna have to resubmit your plan. <laughs> but, I don't know if this question is parks and rec, but, and just help me out, the, the program that the city used to have about um, residential payback for watering your yard. Drop by drop. Drop by drop, mm -hmm. thank mm -hmm. you. Um, will we have anything like that for growing tree, for planting trees? Mm. Not yet, but it'd be great to do that. Um, and if y'all aren't familiar with the drop by drop program, it's through our public works. It's an excellent program. I'm in Pflugerville, water recipient. I'm probably gonna try to get my thousand dollar <laughs> rebate. But uh, yeah, you disable your irrigation system and uh, plant zero scaping or low maintenance plants, they'll give you money for it. So it's an excellent program. I'd love to get something like that started on the forest. It's mostly education based, I think now, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah, if, if we could find a funding source that would support that, you know, if we got a three year grant from the forestry service that every plant, every tree that you planted, they gave us a match or something, yeah. those things yeah. like that would be great. That'd be cool. Good job. It's almost like we need a subcommittee to support this. Another one. <laughs> I, I think we need so I don't think more subcommittees. <laughs> no, I told you, one for ice cream. We're going to have it soon. And you can call it saplings. The saplings. <laughs> and then I think that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you. Anything oh, else uh, for Dave or anything tree care oriented? Do you want me to look at your trees? Just give me a call. Sure. <laughs> Okay, if there's nothing else, uh, I've got 8.27 and I'm going to go ahead and adjourn. Thank y'all. Thank, Thank you. you.